as uh, Tower in Bryant Park, New York. Thank you so much, Holly, for joining us. Thanks for having me, Lynn. Thank you. So today's conversation, we're going to start to talk about the you know recent turmoil in the banking industry. You have a front row seat, being uh, you know a, the the leader of a consumer bank um, in you know the basically the second largest consumer bank in the U.S. Right, and you face a lot of consumers. I think it's 68 million uh, Correct. consumers and small business customers. So can you talk to us a little bit about what you saw in March when the turmoil happened in the industry and we had you know, a couple of large regional bank failures? Sure. So we certainly saw some disruption in the market and you know, our focus really was on our clients. Um, during that time and the system and and getting stability back into the system so that's where our focus was and you know that client focus is ever present for us making sure we are answering their questions we were there to support them during the focus and really continuing on our strategy of responsible growth for our existing client base so since the financial crisis back in 2010 we've adopted that responsible growth strategy um, so we really have been just sticking to our knitting on that, and that came through in this crisis. So really focused on the relationship strategy with, as you said, our 68 million consumer clients across the country. Um, so that's really where our focus was during that disruption. Did you have community members kind of asking you about banking? Did you have family members saying, is my money safe in this or that other bank? Um, you know, what yeah, kinds of sure. things were you hearing? So we were getting all the questions you would imagine from our own clients, from people who are not our clients, um, you know, about the safety and security of the financial system. Um, and, you know, we addressed it very openly and honestly where our focus was, how we stick to our clients, how we support our clients during those times. So, you know, they were the questions that you would have anticipated. Um, there were questions about FDIC insurance and, um, you know, our focus with our client base is, as I said, this relationship strategy. Having a core deposit account, lending to them when they need it for homes or auto or through cards. So um, that core strategy, I think, really helped us through this um, because we had established high levels of um, solid relationships with our clients. Yeah, and looking at your first quarter earnings, I mean, your deposits fell slightly, but you added 130,000 checking accounts. Can you talk a little bit about whether that was related to people wanting to open a Bank of America account because they were seeing turmoil elsewhere? Sure. So part of this responsible growth strategy is organic growth for our business. And we were really focused on that through through the crisis. But we have continued to post good, strong, organic growth results um, even prior to that and, and coming through that. So sticking to our knitting, focused on deepening relationships with our existing clients, um, and then bringing new clients in, which is what you cite, you know, in terms of that organic growth, bringing new deposit clients in, you know, and providing the broad value that we have. And one side of this also is the record consumer investment accounts that you had um, in, in the last quarter as well, and record client flows. Can you talk a little bit about whether your consumer clients are now still investing in which asset classes, what are they participating in with regard to markets, especially during this time of volatility? Sure. I would say they're continuing to invest. Um, as you said, we saw record consumer investment flows. New consumer investment accounts also continued. So that organic growth mantra. Um, and they're looking at the market, right? And they're investing broadly, they're diversifying, and you know, we're seeing them not only want the consumer investment accounts, but you know, continued savings in the traditional banking as well. And a lot of people during the kind of meme stock rally of last year talked about, you know, this kind of frenzied trading because of stimulus money and people kind of getting more money into their accounts. But do you think that this seems to be a persistent trend that more retail investors are staying in the markets and that they're, they're in there for the long haul? I think so. Yeah. I mean, time will tell, but, um, you know, we do see the health of the consumer really strong, and that goes both from a banking perspective and from an investing perspective. And that's something we talk about a lot with our clients is, you know, focus on financial health, having a budget, 
having savings, having an emergency fund, and that requires, you know, both the banking and an investment focus for a client. So um, I do think it's here to stay, and, you know, I hope from a client perspective it's here to stay because I think that is the road to financial health for our clients. Got it. Okay. And so, you know, some of the things that we are looking at in the markets, obviously First Republic was the last kind of regional bank to fail. Your largest competitor, JP Morgan, bought that bank. Now, um, the interesting piece of trivia that maybe a lot of people don't know is that Bank of America used to own First Republic and sold it. Um, so, you know, just looking at the landscape now, given that there are banks under stress, there are potentially opportunities to grow, do you feel any competitive pressure at Bank of America to, you know, uh, acquire at all? I mean, you obviously need to get special permission or you right. have to look at failed assets, but, um, you know, is there some competitive pressure to get larger now that your biggest rival is also getting bigger? Right. I, I don't think we feel, you know, um, undue competitive pressure. You know, we are always looking to be a market leader across the country. You know, we are a leader in consumer banking. Um, and we want to continue to maintain that leadership position. So, um, you know, we will certainly look at opportunities, but, you know, our focus again is on organic growth, growing with our existing clients, 68 million of them. There is a lot to do with those clients, acquiring new clients, um, but clients who want to have a relationship with us. And we're going to do that both through our physical footprint and investing very specifically in different markets, um, renovating our existing footprint where it makes sense. Um, so so there's a, there are a variety of ways that we'll continue to expand our market presence. But we obviously want to be competitive. We want to, we're going to maintain our advantage out there. Um, but I don't think there's any un, undue pressure to do or acquire anything if it doesn't make sense for us. Yeah, and that doesn't make sense part is really key. I think, you know, as someone who's observed the bank for several years and understanding the history of Bank of America post-2008 um, and some of the acquisitions that you had to then unwind, um, you know, there's a lot of baggage there. Yeah, I mean, we will make a smart decision and one that makes sense for our business um, if opportunities are to come along. Got it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the economy and about the macro picture. Um, so you had a pretty strong first quarter. Um, obviously, the consumer business is kind of the largest share of Bank of America's um, revenue and profits, um, a huge engine of, of growth um, in the company, and it actually outperformed some of the other divisions. Um, you know, So can you talk a little bit about what you saw in the first quarter and how that's carrying through to the second or if things have changed? Sure, so for the first quarter, we did have a really strong quarter continued organic growth, um, and that's with new and existing clients, continued new deposit accounts, net new checking, consumer investments account, uh, investment accounts, um, and, you know, we had posted good operating leverage as well, um, you know, many, many quarters in a row on that, and um, so we'll continue to focus on that, and that is our core strategy, right? And I, I keep coming back to organic growth, delivering for, for our clients in a responsible way. And we very much want this relationship strategy. We want the primary relationship with our clients. And you know, this is a statistic that we share, 92% of our accounts are primary, which means that is their core operating account. So we're gonna continue to build that um, as we move forward, and we're doing that in a whole host of ways, right? Through um, great capabilities, simple capabilities, digital and physical. Mm -hmm. And how is the second quarter looking now, given that, you know, you've had some kind of shakeout in the, the first after, you know, sort of banking crisis. How are people doing this time around and how, how is performance looking for, right. for the division? Um, performance is continuing. So we expect good performance for, for the second quarter for the consumer business. And I would say, you know, it continues on the agenda that we've been talking about in terms of organic growth. Um, from a consumer perspective, um, you know, we're still seeing a healthy consumer. Um, and that helps us. But we continue to support our clients um, with financial health. That's going to help them as we move forward. One of the things that's really given the consumer bank a lift is obviously rising interest rates. As the Fed raises interest rates, you also raise interest rates and kind of get big, larger shares of interest rate payments from your clients. Um, so now that the picture around the Fed maybe looks like it's going to pause or slow down, um, how does that affect your in income from interest? 
Um, well, certainly it does affect NII, um, but you know that's something that we plan for, um, and we still come back to our core objective, which is to deliver for clients, whether it's in a high rate environment or a low rate environment, mm -hmm. um, and it comes back to organic growth and responsible growth, right? Mm -hmm. And when we adopted that strategy. Um, it was done so that we could partner with our clients through various cycles. Sure. High rates, low rates, rates in the middle. Um, you know, we want to partner with our clients through every part of the cycle. And so um, regardless of what the rate environment does, we'll stick to that. Speaking of cycles, uh, you know, this is probably the longest foretold recession. Um, you know, Brian, the CEO, has been talking about a mild recession in the second half. Um, What's your outlook for the recession um, going forward? What are you seeing out there? Right, so we obviously in the consumer business pay very close attention to how the consumer is doing. And, and so the consumer is still very healthy. Mm -hmm. And you know when we look and, and make those observations, we look pre-pandemic right back to 2019, which was still a very strong year for the consumer. And so we're st still seeing a healthy consumer. Um, savings and account balances are still well above where they were pre-pandemic, so that that's good because the consumer, if there is in fact a recession, a mild recession in the second half of the year, you know they're well prepared with some cushion to withstand that. So they're still really healthy from an account balance and a savings perspective. Um, we have seen spending slow a little bit, um, but they're still paying their credit card off. So credit card payment rate is another figure that we look at on a regular basis. They're still paying that off at a very healthy clip, higher than they were pre-pandemic. And I think that is a really good sign as to what their mindset is. So they're still continuing to pay at a healthy rate. Um, and then, you know, from a credit and a delinquency perspective, we are seeing those numbers come back to closer to pre-pandemic, um, but that's what you would expect in, in this type of an environment. Got it. And I, I wanted to come back to kind of a more macro lens for a moment. I'm just talking about the fact that we are thinking about the recession, the outlook, and a lot of people are forecasting that. At the same time, we've had this banking turmoil, right? And so... I'm curious if you're seeing, you know, out there that other lenders are starting to pull back, that that banks are becoming tighter on their credit, um, and that that's going to kind of work through the economy and create either a crunch or a slowdown in the economy with regard to economic activity. Sure. So, I mean, certainly lenders are always looking at, you know, what the market is doing. People are very, um, you know, focused on changing environments. Um, we haven't seen any really big moves. Um, we haven't observed that. You know, we are always looking at the market. Um, but again, you know, I come back to our responsible growth strategy. And when when we adopted that, we adopted you know a strategy that we could stick to through the cycles. Yeah. And, and for us, that's key, right? Because we can bring a client on and stay with them even through a recession. Um, that being said, you know, we are very mindful of changing environments. You know, we're very much looking at all the housing markets across the country, looking at where the prices are, et cetera. Um, but we haven't had any major shifts that we've seen quite yet. Okay, great. Now, you have already touched on some of these issues, but I want to get you know, do a deep dive into the consumer business. Yeah. Let's get geeky about people's finances, <laughs> about all the different markets that you're looking at. So you talked about spending slowing, and obviously that, I think on card spending, that was the first time you'd seen a decline since February yes. of 21 in April, and that the spending was down 1.2%. So not a huge decline, right. but still a signal that things right. are slowing. Can you give us some color around that? What is happening to consumers? Where are they slowing down? Where are they reducing spending? Right, well, let me talk about travel. Because that's always that's been a big topic since the pandemic, and yeah. you know the travel doors blew wide open as the pandemic was coming to a close. And I think in the travel space, we're seeing a bit of a mixed bag. So um, we're seeing um, international travel still very strong and spending in international travel good. Um, domestic travel has come down a little bit. Um, you know, in the lodging space, lodging I think has already seen its peak, um, but cruises as an example, um, are, we're still seeing growth in that cruise category. So, um, you know, it definitely is a mixed bag with travel and I would say generally 
Um, the necessities, we're still seeing spending on necessities and maybe a pullback in some of the luxury items. So, so there are a lot of different signals going on with consumer spending that we're watching very closely. Um, but consumers are still spending, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, I think we came out of the pandemic, um, came out of the pandemic with really strong spending and people are normalizing. Interesting. And do you think that these trends, are, are they more micro trends now than they were before? Or do you see trends kind of being more long lasting, for instance, with travel? You know, if we had everyone kind of blow the lid off and now. I think there are probably micro trends. Yeah. 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 Um, I think, again, things are starting to normalize, yeah. um, you know, and at a different pace in different categories. But as a kind of business leader and planner, do you kind of have to look at these trends and and plan for more short-term sort of moves rather than, okay, summer driving season is back, everyone's gonna be in their cars. Like, do you have to kind of yeah. pivot a little bit more? Um, we do pivot, you know, some of which in our card business, as an example, you know, depending on where um, people are spending, we will talk to our clients, you know, with those topical areas in mind. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of our core strategy, you know, card and deposit business, um, nothing really changes dramatically, you know, how clients are thinking about it changes. So, you know, we always like to talk to clients with issues and, and themes that are meaningful to them. So that will shift for us. But the core business remains the same. Got it. And um, I should point out that we are taking audience questions. So um, there's a little drop box on uh, the, the website right now for the live stream. So if people want to send in questions, we've already got a few coming through. Um, so I think this is probably, you, you know, a little bit of a departure from kind of consumer trends, but I think it's relevant um, just based on the pandemic. One person asks, um, you know, are you focusing on digital channels um, and how much are you addressing the growing needs in this area, particularly with competition from fintechs and all these apps that are, you know, making payments and um, banking right. kind of at your fingertips. Right. Digital is core to our strategy. So digital and physical and the integration of that is our strategy on the ground. Um, coming out of the pandemic, digital really it was accelerated. Um, we had great digital adoption pre-pandemic and even better coming out of the pandemic because I think people who were, um, you know, shying away from digital pre-pandemic, it became a necessity. So it was a great accelerator for us. So we will continue to invest in digital. We'll continue to get better. We'll continue to listen to our clients to give them what they need. Um, but I believe digital is a core way we deliver at scale to 68 million clients. Um, we've got, again, great digital adoption and great digital adoption through all the demographics, mm -hmm. um, which is really important. You know, low income, affluent, um, across the generational demographics. Um, and we watch that really closely. We adopt, we adapt um, to what our clients are telling us they want and need. Got it. And in terms of uh, your virtual assistant, Erica, obviously I've covered Erica, you know, throughout yeah. its um, development. And now obviously Erica has had several years to kind of learn and understand consumer right. behavior. Um, I talked to a couple of colleagues yesterday who said, Erica tells me that I spent more this this month than last month, which is annoying, but probably <laughs> right. helpful. Right. Um, talk a little bit about Erica, especially now that everyone is talking about artificial intelligence and how it's being applied right. across businesses. Right. So Erica is a poor, core part of our mobile app. Um, you know, since we launched Erica, there have been over a billion interactions with our clients, which is huge. Um, and Erica continues to get better and better and adapt and learn. And, you know, essentially it's an assistant right in the mobile app that helps clients either answer their questions, in your example, maybe give some answers you don't love, <laughs> but are still really important. Um, and it also helps, you know, navigate the mobile app. Um, you know, I went in the other day to, um, you know, ask a question about um, ordering foreign currency. And Erica took me right to the screen to order a foreign currency. So, you know, there are so many ways Erica makes it easier for our clients. And I think that's really what it comes back to is we're trying to do things in digital that make our clients better and make it easier for our clients. Got it.
Okay, so let's talk. go back to the consumer for a moment. So um, one broad audience question, what do you see in terms of consumer spending over the next year? And again, I know this is difficult. We have an unusual environment cycle could be turning. Um, so you know, where are you seeing the strong or weak spots in, in consumer spending over the next year? Sure. Um, you know, I think we'll continue to see normalization. Um, and you know we'll continue to watch what consumers are doing. It's it's a little hard to predict. You know if in fact we do hit a recession, um, which I think is still to be determined. You know we'll expect to see consumer spending slow. Um, we would expect to see consumer spending going back to necessities versus luxury items, um, and we'll continue to watch that. So you know it really the consumer um, you know they determine what they want to spend on. We're coming out of a cycle that was unprecedented, um, and we certainly learned a lot from that, and we'll continue to learn as we move forward. Um, you know, today we're, st we're seeing consumers spend a little bit more on um, interest payments because the rates are rising, right? They're using their cards a little bit more, so we are seeing a portion of their spending going towards that, um, but we'll continue to watch it. And this kind of idea of the revenge valley from last year and everyone kind of going out. <laughs> revenge buying, travel. <laughs> exactly. Revenge travel, yeah. buying goodies, right, buying luxury right. treats. Maybe that has petered out a bit and people are pivoting back to, um, you know, kind of necessities. and. I think so. And yeah. I think some of what I shared, you know, in international travel and domestic travel is showing some of that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, showing some normalization and spending patterns because certainly, you know, in 2022 we did see, what, you know, what was called revenge travel. I did some of it myself. <laughs> I really go? enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I do think we'll, we'll see some normalization there. Are you going to see more kind of staycations or driving holidays rather than... Um, yeah, I think that's to be determined. You know, based on um, some surveys that we've recently done, the domestic travel seems to be coming down a little bit, where international travel is still strong. Okay. Um, so, you know, we'll watch it and we'll see what the consumer decides to do. Got it. And some of your recent data also shows, though, that consumers are saving more. So can you talk about that kind of barbell? You know, they, they might be, you know, kind of petering down their spending and they're also right. putting more aside. So. Right. So the consumer has saved more since the pandemic. Um, those account balances, checking and savings, you know, on average are about 40 percent higher than they were pre-pandemic. So that's a pretty healthy cushion. That's that's a big number. So I do think the saving pattern of, cl of clients and consumers um, potentially has shifted. Um, you know, I would have thought that that would have come down a little faster, but, you know, it's really been very strong. And so I think the consumer is accustomed now to some cushion in their accounts, which is a good thing, right? And, and I come back to financial health and having savings and having an emergency fund. So um, those are all good, good statistics for the consumer. Yeah, and I know that credit quality has been at the highest in decades at yeah. Bank of America, right? So people are paying their bills. Right. But can you talk a little bit about where you're starting to see, you know, delinquencies, where you're starting to see people maybe run into slightly more signs of normalization or, or stress right. in their accounts? Yeah, I don't think there is any one area in particular. You know, we look at the general consumer trends, um, and I would say, say those delinquencies, early delinquencies, are starting to return to more normal levels is what I would say. Um, you know, I wouldn't say they've peaked. I wouldn't say they've spiked, but they are, you know, we were at an all-time low, and we're starting to see them normalize. Um, and when I say normalize, I'm going back to 2019, which was still a very strong year for the consumer. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's nothing that's really alarming there, but obviously, you know, we're, we're prepared, um, and, you know, we'll stick with our clients through the cycle. And you're seeing that in credit card first? I mean, that's usually where it shows yes. up first? Yeah, yeah, generally. Okay. Yes. All righty. Um, let's talk about a few other markets. So auto. Um, what are you seeing in terms of the auto market? Um, you know, that, that has been a big topic of discussion over the last two years as well. Right. So, um, you know, any any color on that? Yeah. So we're still seeing strength in auto um, in terms of, you know, apps coming through the system. Um, still some supply issues. Um, but auto has been strong for us. 
um, through through the pandemic. And you know, despite some of the supply issues that you hear about in terms of not you know having supplies of cars to purchase, um, so we're continuing to see strength. Um, I would I would say maybe we've seen the peak, um, but it's still strong. And uh, everyone's favorite topic, mortgage, real estate. Right. Let's talk a little bit about real right. estate. Um, you know, you've done a few surveys recently yeah. about uh, people really wanting to buy homes yeah. um, and that being sort of undeterred by the economic right. landscape. Right. Uh, talk a little bit about what you're seeing in mortgage and then we can dig into the details. Sure. So, you know, clearly the biggest part of the mortgage market right now is the purchase market versus refi because so many people were able to refi during the pandemic because the rates were so low. Um, so the vast majority of our mortgage volume is coming through the purchase market. Um, that being said, and you probably read this in some of our surveys, you know, when, when surveyed, clients say that they will, in fact, purchase a home if it is the right home and the right time for them despite the interest rate environment. Right. So you would think that, you know, it would completely dry up with the rates being so much higher than they had been over the prior years. Um, but the consumer still still says that I'll purchase a new home if it's right for me, despite the interest rate environment. So I think that's a positive. Um, you know, that being said, there is a reality that, you know, affordability in a higher rate environment becomes more challenging for people. So, you know, I, I think that's a little bit of a mixed bag. But the consumer, based on our survey, still seems, you know, ha still has a very positive outlook. And are there regional differences? I think, you know, people are always complaining about how hot the tri-state is. <laughs> um, so I don't know if yeah. you're seeing areas where things are particularly tight and, um, you know, where the markets are very strong versus other areas that are a little no weaker. No particular strong shifts from, you know, what we've seen in the past. So, you know, your large tri-state area as an example, continue to see strength, but, you know, so do some of the southern states, the, you know, they call them the smile states. So we haven't seen any big shifts. How's Boston? Boston's still pretty strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Got it. Boston's strong in many ways. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Robert Kraft was just here for an event with Brian Moynihan Oh, I heard, yes. So, yes, um, I heard yeah. that. Um, okay. And so let's talk a little bit, and, and again, this is maybe a little bit of a departure, but on the commercial real estate side, because an audience member was asking about that, what are you seeing in terms of kind of commercial real estate, um, you know, in the kind of broader landscape, given that people are, you know, not going into yeah. offices as much. I know that's right. not maybe in your total wheelhouse, but right. I'm curious about that. Yeah, it's not in my wheelhouse, but what I'll, you know, what I will say is, you know, we continue to manage our commercial real estate portfolio, you know, very tightly. You know, there are differences in there in terms of the types of commercial real estate. And, you know, we maintain a very healthy and high quality portfolio there. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, clearly people are watching it closely with the return to work um, trends and usage of office space. So, um, you know, like everyone, we're, we're watching it very closely. Got it. Okay, so we have another couple of um, consumer topics I want to go over. First of all, you have made changes to your overdraft policies and given various updates over that. But can you, for people who are unacquainted, say sure. what you did with overdraft sure. and then what the results have been so far? Sure. So, you know, we've been on a decades long journey of, you know, shifting our focus on overdraft. Um, and most recently made, you know, what I call an industry leading move to eliminate our NSF fee entirely, um, eliminate our balance connect fee, which is um, the capability to move money from account to account to cover overdrafts. And we reduced our overdraft fee from $35 to $10. Um, and that really was the cornerstone for our moves. Um, and this was really done in an effort to support our clients. Um, we had done a lot of work in the prior decade around creating solutions that provided clients simple, transparent, low cost, no overdraft solutions, so our safe balance account. Um, we have good financial education around better money habits and then you know, the, that last leg was the shift in our actual fee structure and what we were doing. And um, so the results of that have been, you know, exactly what we anticipated. And that is, you know, our fees from NSFOD are down 90% over um, last year, which is exactly what we had planned for. Um, we've gotten great feedback from our clients on that. And, you know, we're an industry leader. If 
if you compare you know, that number. So about less than 10% of our fee revenue um, comes from NSFOD fees. And if you look across the banking space, you know, others are 50% plus. Um, so it was a very bold industry leading move for us, but one um, that was really important as we continue to talk about financial health and supporting our consumer client base, um, you know, it was a very natural move. And you and I have discussed this before, but for the audience, um, there are other banks that have scrapped overdraft fees totally. Um, why did you do that? Um, well, I think the and we heard from clients that they wanted continued access to overdraft as a service. And in order to do that responsibly and continue to provide that service, you know, there needs to be, you know, a nominal charge. Right. And so, you know, for some, you know, and I don't have the details, but, you know, you can't continually provide overdraft for zero dollars. And so when you look at, you know, what we landed with, with our clients in terms of the ability for them to manage short-term liquidity, we have a variety of solutions. We have a free service, Balance Connect, which allows them to connect up to five accounts to cover overdrafts, and that's free of charge. We have a low-cost, low-dollar um, lending option, which is bal called Balance Assist. It's $500 for three months for $5 mm -hmm. flat fee. And then you have the um, overdraft option at $10. So you have that continuum of, you know, and it provides clients a variety of ways that they can give themselves short-term liquidity in a responsible way, right? Because part of the balance here is providing that solution to clients, but also putting them on a path to financial health so that they're not spending money that they don't have. Um, so that was the balance that we were striking. And I think that's also a difficult balance to strike when you also have the administration um, talking about so-called junk fees, right? I know the industry doesn't like that term, but the administration is talking about, you know, fees that are charged on consumers, whether it's in banking or in other areas that are kind of hidden that people don't know about. Um, how does this kind of affect you guys in terms of, um, you know, what you're doing at Bank of America to ensure that, you know, consumers aren't kind of getting hidden fees right. that they don't Aren't aware. Right. Yeah. I mean, certainly we are first and foremost always there to support our clients and to provide complete transparency in what we're doing. So, you know, that is first and foremost. Um, you know, our moves in overdraft were a big move, our um, moves in safe balance. So, creating a very simple, low cost checking account for our clients was really important to us. So, that you know, that was a part of how we're doing this for clients, giving them a simple, low-cost, transparent account with which to operate. Um, and we're always looking at, you know, the value we provide clients and the fees that go along with that. And we're always course correcting and adjusting. We're taking client feedback. So, you know, that's something that is always evolving for us. And, um, you know, first and foremost, we are always there to support our clients. And the goal is to have a long-term relationship with them. And the way you do that is providing simple solutions, transparent pricing, and a lot of value, right? So one area we've really focused on with our clients is the value they get by having a relationship with us. You know, a free mobile app, access to better money habits, access to Zelle, um, access to life plan, access to online banking, access to a security center. So all those things surround their relationship with the bank free of charge, right? So um, that relationship value is really where we're trying to wrap this. Okay. Um, I'm going to speed it up a little bit because yes. I'm starting to get more questions. So uh, back on consumer spending for a moment, um, are you seeing more delinquencies among lower FICO score customers is, or, or um, lower income customers? Are there any segments where you're starting to see more delinquencies? Um, the delinquency trends are... Um, pretty similar across FICO scores. You know, obviously you see more delinquency in lower FICO scores just by nature of how that works. Um, but nothing that has really jumped out in terms of one particular segment, you know, really skyrocketing. And do you expect continued normalization? I know you're seeing yes. it now, but okay. yes. 
Got it. Okay. Um, a, another question from um, a read or a viewer who wants to talk about AI. I know we talked about Erica a little bit, but where do you see the kind of opportunities versus threats and challenges with regard to AI use in the consumer business? Sure. Maybe so, fraud, perhaps, or anti-fraud. Right. Um, well, AI is really important to us. Erica is foundational to that in terms of how we're using AI and intelligence to help our clients make it easy and give them information. And that's, that's really where we'll continue to focus on it. You know, we're of course looking at options to leverage AI to make it easier for our associates to do business, right? And, and how do we make it easier for them to get the information they need to assist our clients? I think that's a really big opportunity for us with AI. Um, and some of the things that we've all read about in terms of gener generative AI, um, because the information that you use with that is contained and controlled within the bank. And I think that's one of the things that we, we look out for is, you know, AI is only as good as the information that it's taking from, so you have to be really careful with that. But there are huge opportunities to use it for our associates to make it easier for them. Um, we'll continue to evolve Erica, which is the cornerstone for how we're delivering through our client base, you know, right in the mobile app. So um, there, are, there are a whole host of uses, and obviously, you know, we're looking at the cutting edge technology out there. Our digital team and our technology team are, you know, at the forefront of all of that. Are there any examples, any case studies you can think of that might, you know, might work, um, you know, or that are very obvious that jump out at you? Right. So one of the things that we're looking at internally is, you know, how do we, could we use Erica um, and generative AI to um, assist our teams when they're looking through policies or procedures or for information? So that's, that's one of the areas that we're looking at. Interesting. Okay, great. Um, okay, let's move on to uh, some career questions because I think, um, or actually, no, let's, let's go back to Zelle for a moment because uh, that's a topic close to my heart. I wrote a story when I was back at the New York Times about Zelle um, and fraud on Zelle. Um, and obviously, you know, there, there are huge concerns around whether fraud is rising as a result of Zelle and other payments apps. Can you talk about what's happening now in terms of any changes that banks such as yourselves have made to um, sort of prevent fraud on, on Zelle? Sure. So first and foremost, safety and security of our clients and their money is priority number one, <laughs> you know, and, and so that is front and center for us. Um, Zelle is probably one of the biggest innovations we've had for clients, um, probably since the mobile app or the ATM machine. Um, it's a huge innovation for clients. Clients wanted it. You know, they want instant ability to send money to friends and family and people that they know. Um, and we've had huge adoption of Zelle um, across the industry and at Bank of America. And just to give you a stat, so our clients sent more Zelle transactions than they wrote checks in 2022 by a lot. So um, it is an innovation and a technology that clients want. Um, that being said, you know, as, as people get used to new technology, um, you know, there are certain protections that I think we have to share with them. So we're continuing to educate. We continue to um, do anything that we can to stop any fraud coming in. Um, and the reality of the fraud is that it is lower than any other payment mechanism that we have. So, you know, the, that does not, you know, eliminate any individual issues. So of course, we're there to support our clients when they have an issue, educate them, support them where we can. And we've adjusted some, um, some approaches as we've worked with EWS in, in that process. Got it. Okay, so let's talk about your career. Sure. Life and career. Um, so you started out at Bank of America as a credit analyst in 1996. I did. In Boston. You're based in Boston. Um, so talk a little bit about also your steps through the different divisions. You were CEO of corporate banking. You were CEO of private banking. So you've kind of moved around different business lines at Bank of America. Talk about how that came to be and how you stopped in sure. those different business lines. Yeah, so, you know, I feel really lucky to have had the stops that I've had. And, you know, when I tell people that I've been at the company for 27 years, you know, I see young people, their eyes, you know, really widen. I can't believe you've been there for that long. I mean, you're a dinosaur first. Um, but 
it's been anything but boring or the same. So as you said, I came in through the corporate bank. I w was a credit analyst. I learned to analyze companies. And um, you know, I was given opportunities all along the way from mentors, bosses, peers, to try new things. And that's really what I loved. Um, I loved the client piece when I was in the global banking business. Um, you know, and when I shifted into global wealth management, I loved the strategy component. What does that business look like? How are we going to shift it? You know, what are clients saying? How are we going to how are we going to drive market share? So I really liked that strategy component. And then shifting into the consumer business seven years ago, um, I didn't realize you know how impactful that would be, and you know how energizing it is to manage that business at scale with 68 million consumer clients and really make a difference, you know, in their daily lives. Um, so I've been given a lot of different opportunities. I've taken some risk, but I've been supported by some really amazing leaders um, to take that risk along, along the way. So, you know, the career has shifted a lot as I've been here for 27 years. Um, and it's been really fun. Um, it's been really rewarding. I've certainly had some challenges. Um, I've failed in some assignments, um, and I've had some really hard assignments that I maybe didn't want. <laughs> um, but those tend to be the ones you learn the most from. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's been certainly a career that has been really rewarding. I'm, you know, really grateful for it. So 27 years in finance, um, it has not always been the most hospitable place for women, right. um, particularly when you started out. Can you talk a little bit about, and, and even now, management teams, they are more representative than they were before. We only have one female CEO of a major Wall Street bank. Um, talk a little bit about how things have changed um, and where things still need to go. So things have changed a lot, um, tremendously, really. If I look back to 27 years ago, you know, when I first joined the bank, you didn't talk about your personal life, you didn't talk about family, none of that, and that really has shifted. Um, as I mentioned, I've been very lucky um, to have been supported by a whole host of amazing leaders, men and women, at this company. And I think at the bank, we have done a really good job driving diversity in our company from the very highest level. So when you look at our board, it's about a third women and over half diverse. When you look at our management team, the same, it's about a third women and over half diverse. So we've made progress, but we still have progress to make. And I think, you know, there's an accountability on, you know, myself and my peers to continue that forward. And really to make it welcoming for anyone to come into this company and succeed and be themselves. Male, female, you know, any ethnicity. And that, that's really the goal at the end of the day. Um, and again, so we've made a lot of progress, but there's always more progress out there to make. And, you know, I, I feel an accountability to pay that back and pay it forward to others. And how have you done that? I mean, I've seen your social media videos where you talk about, you know, the role, various roles you have yeah. at work and at home um, and, you know, the caretaking that you do for your family. Right. How do you kind of figure all of that out? Right. Well, um, number one, I have a great partner in my husband. Um, he's incredibly supportive, as are my, my kids. Um, and, you know, I think talking a little bit more about it is something I've been trying to do more lately because I think that helps people think I'm not alone. Um, I think for women in particular, I really try to focus on confidence and risk taking because I think that's an area where we still can do better. Um, and having that confidence to take a risk and knowing that you have the support behind the scenes to do it. Um, and even if you fail, knowing that you can pick yourself back up. So, you know, talking about it more, having a great support system, um, and taking that risk, taking the shot at doing something, I think those are really important. What was the biggest risk you took in your career? I think actually coming to the consumer business. I, you know, I came from Global Wealth where I was the COO of the private bank, right? A super awesome job. <laughs> and I moved into consumer where I was running call centers. And, you know, I did that for two people who had complete faith in me. 
um, and gave me the support I needed, and it was great. I mean, I wanted to own something myself. I wanted to manage a business at scale. I learned a tremendous amount, but that was probably the biggest risk. You know, I went from managing 100 people to 12,000 people overnight, um, and, you know, I was given the opportunity, and I uh, closed my eyes a little bit and jumped. <laughs> Um, and it was it was really the best move I made. Well, it seems to have worked out. So thank yes. you very much, Holly, and thank you to our viewers um, today for listening to this wonderful conversation with Holly O'Neill. Again, she is the president of retail banking at Bank of America, and this is Reuters Newsmakers. Thank you so much.